All right, you guys, it's another episode of America's Hometown Horror that is brought to you yet again by Shine Through Window Cleaning. Shine Through Window Cleaning, in case you haven't heard, is a family-owned and operated company that proudly serves Plymouth and the surrounding area. They treat your home or business like they would treat their own, and they truly believe in building their reputation on every job they do. Get in touch with Shine Through today to discuss your window cleaning, gutter cleaning, and power washing needs at 781-812-9189. That's 781-812-9189 or at shinethroughwindowcleaning.com. Their new website, that's Shine, T-H-R-U, Window Cleaning. Get in touch with Shine Through Window Cleaning today. What is up, folks? How's everybody doing tonight? It's your buddy Mike from America's Hometown Horror. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to another episode of the show. We are very happy to have you here, and I truly hope that you are having a very fun and very spooky October. Hopefully, you have uh, done lots of fall things, you know, checked out some of the haunted attractions that we've uh, we've been recommending so highly over the last couple of weeks and watched some scary movies to get you in the Halloween mood and try and save Halloween for this year. And with that being said, uh, we do have a very special episode tonight uh, that we kind of teased a few weeks back towards the end of September, and uh, we we did it a remote interview that is uh, pretty cool, and we had a really good time doing it. It's why I'm kind of recording this little intro after the fact here, but uh, yeah, we were lucky enough to be invited by Andy Hannah and Fish from Old Colony Cast to head on down to lovely Barnstable, Massachusetts on Cape Cod to the oldest wooden jail in the United States. And we actually um, were able to record in this building, which is, uh, when I say building, it's, it's about two rooms. One room is filled with very small cells. The other room is, you know, just kind of the front part of the building. But we were lucky enough to be able to go there. Thanks again to uh, to Andy for the invite, and we were able to interview Derek Bartlett uh, from the Cape and Islands Paranormal Research Society. Uh, awesome guy. We had a hell of a time talking to him about all kinds of things, from you know his work as a as a ghost hunter on the Cape and kind of across the country, along with you know some of the things he's seen, some of his favorite horror movies, and it's just an interesting very wild conversation so if you are into the paranormal that side of things which we've covered in a few different episodes uh this is the one for you i should also mention that this is a two-part episode so we recorded this first part where we interviewed derek uh, about all things uh, you know haunted cape cod and specifically this old jail that we were in And Andy Fish and Hannah had a second part of the interview where they were talking about some of the history of the building and, you know, some of the other buildings that uh, Cape and Islands Paranormal Research Society has uh, has investigated in the past. So, again, a two-parter. This one is out, obviously, today on our feed. You can check out the second part of, uh, of Old Colony Cast's interview with Derek Bartlett from the Cape and Islands Paranormal Research Society. That will be dropping on October 29th over on Old Colony Cast, our good buddies on the Inebriart Podcast Network. So make sure you head over and check that out and hope you guys enjoy the interview. I know I did. All right, what's up, folks? It's another episode of America's Hometown Horror, a very special episode tonight as uh, we are coming to you live from the old jail in Barnstable, Massachusetts, or the old Gaul as it used to be called, right? Did I pronounce that right, Derek? That's correct. Okay, perfect. But uh, yeah, very special episode tonight, so uh, we have a lot of guests on hand, so I'm just going to go around the horn and introduce everyone here. Obviously, as we do every week, uh, my name's Mike, by the way, we're joined by my co-host Kat and Andrew. Guys, how, how are you? Guys? Hello. What's going on? And uh, also, in addition to that, we have some of uh, our guests from the Inebriate Podcast Network with us. We have Andy, Fish, and Hannah from Old Colony Cast. Guys, how are you doing tonight? Hello. 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 And last, of course, but certainly not least, you've already heard him speak, we have Derek Bartlett from Capers, the uh, Cape and Islands Paranormal Research Society, who has been kind enough to give us a tour, uh, not only of this jail that we are sitting in right now recording, but also the cemetery across the street. Thanks so much for the tour, man, and we're so happy to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. 
I mean, I feel like this was an easy sell whenever Andy came to me and was like, hey, do you want to do a uh, haunted overnight or a haunted podcast yeah. episode down at the old jail in Barnstable? I was like, yeah, sign me up. I don't know if I finished my thought before you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a pretty pretty easy sell for me. But, um, you know, obviously we, you know, we came here, we kind of had the tour already. So I know you kind of already went through your spiel, Derek, but uh, if you could kind of just, I guess first and foremost... Tell us a little bit about the building that we're sitting in here and, you know, some of the some of the experiences and things that you have uh, seen coming here all the time. Well, the building we're sitting in um, was constructed originally in 1690 by the Order of Massachusetts and Plymouth Bay Colony Courts. And the portion we're sitting in here was added in 1830 to actually co- connect to the constable and his wife's home. Um, you know, when we first started coming to the building, it was more for the historical aspect. You know, I had heard a ghost story way back when in 2001 um, from uh, the curator who used to be Barnesville Historical Society here and she told me about this residual haunting or energy imprint in time of a woman that could be seen standing in one spot just looking out into the parking lot. And then so cleaning up the building had been sealed up for years and all of a sudden you know started hearing footsteps in other parts of the room and thinking someone had come through a back door, went back there, didn't find anyone, came up to the front you know because we heard footsteps in a chair move no one was here, so we started ghost hunting. You know, I've been ghost hunting for over 20 years now and uh, brought digital voice recorders out, you know, trying to make, collect EVPs, electronic voice phenomena, and asking questions of the dead. And the first question, of course, you always ask is, who's here? Immediately we get a sponsor, uh, a man saying Joel Smith and a woman saying Mary. And that's what started us ghost hunting in this building is because of hearing the footsteps and then recording those voices. Awesome. That's pretty cool. Um, so I, I know... You've talked a little bit to us already about some of the experiences that you've had here, uh, kind of recreated them, some of them in detail in pitch black out back and where the old jail cells were, were uh, where we were earlier. Um, could you tell us a little bit about some of the experiences that you had while you're in here? So over the years of coming here into the building, bringing my tours, and it's just not myself, it's people mostly on the tours that have experience or some of the ghost hunting groups that I've had and weren't able to host inside the building. They've had experience as well. Um, and the most common one we started to see at first was tall, dark, shadowy figures appearing in the darkness, you know, shifting around past the doors, past the lights, um, past doorways. You could see when the dark gets darker and just starts shifting. And then people get the sense of someone standing next to them. And they turn on their lights and no one's there. And, you know, they were big and broad figures. I only saw them a few times in the beginning. And then, so everybody's got the impression they were men because of how tall and broad they were. Sure. Well, they really then let us know they're men because it's kind of funny when any ladies are here inside the building and these figures show up, they tend to play with women's hair and sniff it. So if you're ever in this building and you hear that sniffing sound in your ear, you hear the touch of your hair, it's probably them. Yeah, that's pretty wild. I think uh, Kat and Hannah are probably pretty happy that that, did, that didn't happen. No, them. thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally, holding my breath. Don't, don't. I'm totally, not totally understandable. Kat probably has a new creep of the week now. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess just kind of overall general questions about some, some of your experiences as a, you know, a quote unquote ghost hunter, I guess, for a lack of a better term or a paranormal investigator. So, right. so what do you think in essence makes a building haunted or like, you know, I guess any building, but more specifically a building like this. So this is not the original place it was located. It yep. was actually moved here in the seventies and, uh, we actually believe there was one here, maybe possibly two that were lingering around because of the stories we had heard from the old, uh, the curators of the historical society. But I think it's when we started hearing things and we started communicating, others were drawn. Like, cause over the years it just started out with just a couple things and then talking to the dead, ghost hunting the building. Then we started seeing a little bit more and more like a couple of a year or two later after we started taking the building over in 2008, we started noticing another smaller figure appearing that was never seen the first couple of years it, and it recorded a little child's voice talking and then more became evident as years had progressed like an old man started showing up poking people um and throughout the years people had seen this figure with no legs pulling himself across the floor and people were having experiences of things crawling across their feet and grabbing onto their ankles as they stood in this building and before i even said anything um and that's the great thing i believe actually that makes the building haunted or the, the oldest wooden jail is the energy that I bring in here from people. I mean, I think there was one or two here, like I said, but I think it's us communicating with the dead, kind of like with the Ouija board, you're 
kind of talk to the dead. You open yeah. something up. Yep. Yeah. And they move in here. And there has been a couple of times we actually had to shut down this building um, for about a week and a half because there were things moving in here that shouldn't have been moving like they were non-human. Like, Almost like, like too aggressive. Like Spider-Man across the wall. You could see him crawling sideways on the wall. <laughs> and we knew that's negative energy and non-human entities. So we avoid, and for safety's sake, for people on my tour, as well as my tour guides and myself, yeah, we didn't come in the building until it was gone or we, we felt it was gone and hasn't shown up in the last couple of years. So to follow up on what you kind of just said there, so what are some of the signs when you see, how, like how do you determine when something is uh, a human entity or a non-human entity? Uh, that's hard. You know, um, yeah. I'm still trying to figure out what a ghost is or entity is or, sure. you know, uh, we deal with two forms of hauntings, residual energy and printed time intelligent act like humans, like were mm-hmm. people at one time who passed away who are still sticking around. It's when they, they they do normal things, you know, they, they, you know, show up, they walk, they, you know, move items within the room. It's when they become almost non-human, like, like the one I was mentioning, crawling across the wall. No human can crawl across the wall. Um, energy is create, you know, is around us all the time. And they've been known as tricksters too. The ones that were non-human, never people, but they want to come in and, become human so they trick people when we're doing some investigations to pretend they're the cute little old lady or the little boy or the woman humming oh woman can you come and hum some more and press my friends and all of a sudden you're inviting it to stay and then it shows its ugly head and when i say ugly head it's not throwing dishes what you see on most movies or what's out there now it's emotional drain from the family um they start arguing a lot more you know, there's that negative dread from other people, people that are emotionally already on like a little bit hard time through their lives become even more. Um, and it's not the closet with a nun walking out of it or, you know, no portal <laughs> yeah, or yeah. anything like that. It's very subtle, but it's very negative. Um, you know, I had an experience with a negative entity. All I said, a figure walked in, never looked at it, but every single negative emotion fled from my body from my childhood to that day from fear, anger, revenge, sadness, jealousy. And it only lasted five seconds and I jumped out of the room and yeah. it, that part of me, you know, I, that's how I experienced the negative energy and that's from one of my cases and other cases, it's the negative energy. I mean, it's, it's not the creepy things you see in theater now. Yeah. It's not figures and things floating with hair and wire and yeah. old ladies or, you know, creepy little men walking around. It's the dread and the fear and the negativity to your family. Sure. So that's like, what it happens. It's not like the conjuring or insidious or anything like that. that no, it, the know. conjuring, I mean, yeah, it's not insidious, but it, it, there's some truth behind some of the stories. They're taken from real actual stories. Sure. I'm not going to take that away from them, but it, it is, you know, it's. Yeah. So safe to say that experience you had, where you felt all those anxious feelings, was that the most frightening experience that you've ever had on, a, on, a, on an investigation before? There on that investigation, Yes. Yep. Yeah, that on a during investigation, but there's a time I left an investigation, nothing happened. I fell asleep for 24 hours, woke up, knocked back who I was. I thought I was going through a midlife crisis. I hated my job, hated my girlfriend, hated my car, hated my apartment. I went on a four day bender of just self destruction, came back with my tail tucked between my legs, kind of apologized to her, and then. Made up, had uh, dinner, and was watching some TV, lying in bed. All of a sudden, I look across the bedroom, and over on the other side of the doorway, looking over the doorway, appears an arm and a head. And I get the impression it was a 12-year-old boy looking into the, the room. And I was about to say something, and that's when my fiance at the time said, do you see him? And she saw her too, and I made her shut the door because the door shut from her side, not my side, because... You crawl across the door, everything is going to jump and get you. Oh, you know yeah. that. You know. That. <laughs> so I made her shut it. How, yeah. how manly of me! Wow. But that night we heard furniture moving. We heard um, a woman humming. We 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 saw things like we wow. heard things. The next morning I woke up. I was living in Manamet. You know. Yeah. Right in your yeah. territory. Sure. At the time when this happened. Sure. And the next day I woke up. Nothing was moved in the house. We had coffee. We were talking about what happened. Well, all of a sudden, out of the back corner, we heard a noise. We'd look, and there looks like a big ball of barbed wire coming out of the air towards us. Oh my and that's where we ran outside, and we stood in our driveway and that's called so for help. And we called, and someone came in, blessed the house, and gave me onyx and hematite. I fell asleep for another 24 hours. Granted, I didn't get much sleep that night. And then I went back to who I was four days previously. Whoa. 
So when I say I was partially possessed, people go, how does that happen? I thought I was going through a midlife crisis. That's the only way. I was awake. I was just hated my life for four days. Yeah. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. So it's terrifying. Obviously, you know why I looked at you when he just said the thing about the ball with uh, razor wire. Well, oh, yeah. 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 Phantasm. Yeah. So <laughs> Phantasm is one of his favorite horror movies. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so no, that's no, immediately what I thought of. <laughs> that is so Boy. It's insane. Boy. <laughs> Um, this, this is just uh, wild stuff. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the different tools that you use when you're on investigation? I know we did some EVP stuff earlier. Uh, what yeah. else do you guys use when you're on investigations? You know, doing it for 20 years, you see it climb throughout the whole, over the years, you see it increase, the, the development of equipment becomes better. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to tell your listeners right now, do not, I repeat, do not go online and buy a ghost detector. <laughs> or download a ghost detector app. There is no such thing. Yeah. We use pieces of equipment in our field to detect fluctuations in the environment or changes in our in the field around us because they say ghosts are hauntings are already based. Yeah. We use audio equipment um, to, to, to try to collect voices of the dead. Um, so voice recorders, still cameras, video cameras, electromagnetic field detectors. Mm-hmm. Like I said, they detect fluctuations in electrical and magnetic fields. Yep. Um, air ion particle counters. Detect positive and negative ions and charges in the air. And we have other equipment. Um, motion detectors. Uh, we have actually have a, a piece of equipment. It, it's Wendy Patterson, who's one of my team members, actually gave it to me to use. And it's called the Boo Bear. It's a little bear. You can buy it. It's a motion sensor, but it p- detects fluctuations, electromagnetic fields. So it has green light on it. All of a sudden, its palms turn red when something comes near it. What? It's a little cute little animal. It's cute. It's it's funny. Um, it's you know more for not for me to use. It's more for anybody that likes to do a haunted overnight in this jail. Um, you know for them to watch. But like that's that's usually it. I mean, and the most important equipment of all is the viewer, the person experiencing. No matter what you have in front of you, it's the person viewing the equipment and viewing the surroundings that is the most important piece of equipment on a ghost hunt or a paranormal investigation. Okay. Awesome. So let's say uh, I'm a listener of this show. I have some weird stuff going on in my house, mm-hmm. my apartment. I think it might be some sort of a haunting. What would you recommend a person in that situation do? Um, so it depends on what, what your listener wants to do about it. Sometimes they don't want to do anything and they want it just to go away. I tell people, ignore it. Do not talk to it. Don't give it energy. It might get bored of you and move to your next door neighbors. However, it could be like a little child and want more attention. And when you start ignoring it, the activity might increase. Right. Then they might contact a team like mine, you know, to look into it. Now, looking into it is very intrusive, actually, because you're allowing us to interview you and anybody who has had an experience in your house um, or the location. And then we look at the history of the building from the deeds office to the deeds records. Um and then interview, I mean, and we sit and wait. And that's all we do as ghost hunters. We sit and we wait and we, we wait. And it can be tedious and intrusive. I mean, you see the shows that last an hour, but that could be a two, three, two-week process. Mm-hmm. Um, counseling, I do a lot of counseling nowadays over the telephone, you know, to help people going through what they're going through. Sure. I don't have all the answers. And if I don't have the answers, I'll lean on one of somebody in the field that knows it or it depends on their help they want. They might have a believe in a higher power so i might get in contact with someone that believes in their higher power to bring them in for a positive influence in their lives you know maybe they're just just need it okay awesome i'll keep that in mind in case anything ever follows me home after this (laughs) (laughs) i hope so too i hope so too but I, i guess we'll see um so i know you mentioned before um that you've done investigations out in western mass so obviously you're not confined to just the Cape and the islands, but uh, can you tell us about some of the most exciting investigations that you've been on, some of the coolest locations you've been to, oh. just some stories there if you could. Oh, let me see. Investigations. A lot of my cases go to residential homes. Um, yep. I was That was my big thing is helping those people. Yep. Uh, but I've been to Waverly Hill Sanatorium. Oh, I've that's, been that's to. Awesome. Um, I've been to the original house in St. Louis with the exorcist really happened wow. yep i've been to um oh i can't even tell you like it's a lot of great places throughout the years of doing this and it's going to old homes um some famous people's homes 
that used to own it at one time. Now it's just a subsidiary of a town mm -hmm. in like in Roxbury. I'm thinking of this this Pudding Stone house. It was, it was beautiful. Sure. And he was like a mayor or or a, a colonel or something very famous. And that was a beautiful home. Um, but yeah, I've been across the country. I've been in California. I've been um, never out of the country. I've stayed in the country, but Illinois. My friend Troy Taylor over there, and the author of Ghost Hunters Guidebook, that actually got me started in this. Yep. He, uh, I've been to a lot of his places. I'm in Lincoln Theater, where the late last seance was held by mm -hmm. um, Miss Lincoln, trying yep. to contact her husband, yep. you know, things like that. So it brings you to these wonderful places. And there are teams out there that allow you, like, for me, you come into the oldest wooden jail in the United States murder. Other teams can go like, oh, go to Ohio State Reformatory or go to Waverly Hills Sanatorium, go to Lizzie Borden House. You know, they, there's other teams that run things like this. Yeah. They allow you to get in it. So, I don't know. It's been 20 years, you know? Yeah. So, I remember some of my great cases, locations, though. It's it's Some of some of my great locations have been just a normal home. Yeah. It would be a pretty cool way to experience some travel, go to some new places, do an investigation. It's pretty wild. Um how was Waverly, uh, Waverly Hills? I watched a lot of documentaries and stuff on that. I know that's supposed to be real a hot. Roofers, are you tired of using a bunch of selling tools that don't talk to each other? Streamline your selling process with GAF Project. Manage leads, measurements, presentations, estimates, even payments. Right on your iPad. Visit GAF.com slash project. Bed for paranormal activity. So the night. One of the most haunted places in the country. I get the tour of that building, and it was the last night before they started their Halloween haunted house in it. So they were just cleared out, it was, and there was just starting Halloween season. We're the last tour of the season for regular normal tours. And we walked through, and they talk about Big um, big Black. I think he's up on the third floor. And we saw something. But the funny was is how people react. So they brought you down in the basement, you know, and you don't know the room. It's dark. It's very dark, like the jail. And you just follow the tour guide's voice. You kind of go in. There's no light. And they shut the door, and you start talking. And you think the room is maybe 20 feet by 40 feet but then they pop the lights on and it's like 80 feet by 150 feet and everybody's gathered together in the mass like in a huddle in a corner yeah you don't you're not just straggled like you're all straggled throughout the building but you have all suddenly came closer like tonight in the old jail right. yes. i noticed two of you were a little bit closer to me tonight yeah, yeah. also you got closer i'm like whoa wait a minute you guys like something's kind of like just Pushing bringing you to the living. Like, I need yeah. to get away from that. Yeah, that area. Me. And I, I did smell peppermint down there. And they did peppermint back in the day to mask the smell of dead bodies. Right. So, so if I remember correctly, Waverly Hills was the old tuberculosis facility, right? That's they had, They had the, I think they called it the death chute, where they, they wheeled all the bodies. Oh, out. yeah. I saw it. I yeah. got to see that. That's awesome. wild. That's, that's, that's so cool. Ever been on investigations in Plymouth before? I don't know if you're at liberty to say. No, a few residential homes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I have, but not throughout the town or anywhere famous. Okay. Um, there was a gentleman I got to go into a commercial building where I know a tour runs into. Mm -hmm. And he brought me in through a whole bunch of stuff. I even saw the haunted tram. Whatever that haunted tram is, there's a building that has a haunted tram. And yep. It's in a book in Plymouth. I saw it. I got to push it around like a little kid. <laughs> you know, and... It was fun. It was it was good. It wasn't pure investigation, like sitting for hours, but I get to chill out in the building for an hour and a half, just kind of like me and a couple other people. It was good. It was good times. That's awesome. Huh. Yeah, I know because we we covered we did an episode on haunted Plymouth. Uh, we actually we did a couple episodes on haunted Plymouth. We we covered uh, Spooner House Museum, mm -hmm. uh, Browns Bank, Burial Hill Cemetery. Oh, Burial Hill. Uh, yeah. uh, it wasn't the John Carver oh, Inn? But John Carver Inn. Yeah, we talked we about, about Portage Park. So uh, Browns Bank. I wanted to bring up Burial Hill. So I was up in Burial Hill years ago with my team, and we we're walking through it, doing a historical tour, because a lot of us love history. You can't have a good ghost story without some great history. Sure. And we we're walking through Burial Hill, and right where the ship, the white fence is, with the mass burial of the, or the memorial marker for the oh, yeah. ship. that For the ship out of yeah. Brown's Bank, yeah. We actually saw a white mist, and we captured it on film. Wow. Something going over it, and we looked. Whoa! This is the General Arnold. The General Arnold. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And <laughs> it's been years. Of course, I'm lucky. I knew how to tie my shoes this yeah. morning. But no, the General Arnold. We're coming up from the valley up to the. G g there's a valley down below, and then we're coming up to the General Arnold. And we saw. I we got this awesome white mist coming through the air, and it wasn't. The weather was perfect. The wind created. There was no smokers. It just something that stuck in my mind that. Burial Hill Cemetery is really great. I know we were kind of talking before about 
you know, ghost hunting TV shows. And I feel like every time you turn on the TV now on A&E or the Travel Channel or History Channel or what have you, there's a new ghost hunting show out there. Yeah, why not? So, you know, I mean, I feel like uh, the, the ones that I've kind of seen the most, obviously, Ghost Hunters kind of kicked it off on sci-fi. I've watched a lot of ghost adventures. Uh, what are your thoughts on some of the, sh- the TV shows that are out there? <laughs> I see you laughing already. Uh, no, so I, I guess not, and, and, and how, not... how, how accurate are the depictions in those shows? Okay. So for me, as a ghost <laughs> hunter and um, – and you, as a podcaster, yes, and you've listened to podcasts before, mm-hmm. and you've heard how podcasts are done, sure, and you've heard the really crappy ones, yes. And are you a sports fan? Yes, sir. What team do you like? Uh, Patriots, my favorite team. Okay, when the Patriots are losing, mm-hmm. do you get up and start yelling at the TV set and come on, guys, blah blah blah, you can Absolutely. do better. What, what are you doing there? What are you doing <laughs> yes, there? What are you doing, I, there? What are you doing I, there? Yes, I do. Or you hear a podcaster <laughs> doing really bad. You're like, what is he doing? What, I yeah. can't. Get, he has to get closer to the mic. Yeah. Same thing as a ghost hunter watching those shows. Okay. I see him do something wrong. I start editing and start screaming at the TV set. It's like yeah. watching someone. If you had a day job, watching someone do your day job, yeah. either really well or really bad. And I kept on finding myself getting aggravated with the TV set. Sure. So I just hit the highlights once in a while from here and there. Um, people have personalities. They just, what yeah. makes a show, and they're great personalities, and there's great shows. Um, so for a not for a ghost hunter, we all like some of the shows. I like the true ones that really in depth with the history. The history is accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I told you guys I work closely with the Holter Files, a new new show on A and E, uh, and yeah, they brought back Hans Holter's old ghost investigation and got to go back to the building. And one of the buildings I worked with it was actually right down the street from the old jail is the Barnstable House, House of Loving Ghost. Yep, and they depicted so well on TV, I couldn't. I've seen so many shows depict the wrong place. I'm like screaming at them. They're yeah. Like, that's wrong. I know that's wrong. And I go in my history books. I open it up and I, yeah, sure enough, it was wrong. Yeah. But they did such a well history. Even if the ghost part or whatever's not even there, just for the history aspect of ghost shows, to see things around our country that are historic is awesome. And I'm really glad for shows like that. And plus the little evidence they might get. Yeah, for sure. Um, so obviously, you know, we're sitting in, in, what is called one of the most haunted prisons in America, the oldest wooden prison in America. Go ahead, sorry. Oldest wooden jail. Oldest wooden, sorry. Wooden jail. Oldest wooden wooden jail. In the United States. Or the Gaul. Yes, 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 the Gaul, exactly. Um, So what are some of the other most haunted places on Cape Cod? Well, I mean, there's so many great ghost stories. Like up the street, I was mentioned, the House of Eleven Ghosts. Yes. It's a commercial building. Um, Unfortunately, you know, it's not open to the public. It is office spaces. Um... You can drive down Old Kings Highway, which is Route 6A, Mm -hmm. and go from Sandwich all the way to Provincetown and find a good ghost story. There's bed and breakfasts that are here, you know, um, Beachwood Inn, you know, there's ghost hunters have been here a few times, did um, now I believe it's called the Rose Inn. It was called another name a few years back um, that you can stay at. Mm -hmm. There's there's cemeteries, a few of them. Sagamore Cemetery is haunted. It's in the Weird New England book. Uh, and you can go to Yarmouth Ancient Cemetery. That's haunted. Mm-hmm. You can stop in to many restaurants and bed and breakfast. Like Scargo Cafe is haunted. You can go to Scargo Tower on the way. I'm, I'm thinking right down Route 6A. Sure. All the way to Provincetown. And into Provincetown, you can, they have a ghost tour down there that you can take. And, you know, you can go, if you're really into the macabre like I am in history, you know, the Lady of the Dunes, she's buried out in Provincetown, you know, and it's right next to, like, I bring my friends down there and show where she's buried. It's a great unsolved murder mystery, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it's unsolved. Um, right. But it's been brought up too many times, you know, and, and you could take historical walks, you know, without going into buildings to be haunted location. Now, is that mm-hmm. cemetery haunted because she's buried there? No. But it's a piece of history. And then you go out to the beaches and lighthouse. There's so many places that are accessible. Just have to just look into the history or contact me. Mm-hmm. Either way, I'll give you and send you down a road wherever you want to go, and I'll tell awesome. you about a ghost story. So while you're on, the, you mentioned the Lady of the Dunes, and obviously you're wearing a Jaws T-shirt right now. Have you yeah. ever heard the conspiracy theory that the Lady of the Dunes was actually in Jaws when Spielberg was filming it somewhere in the background? I did. She was yeah. on the dock. She was yeah. on the dock scene coming off yep. the boat yep. um, or going to the boat. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. Now. A lot of medical dental work done on her. Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to mention one that I actually think is accurate on the air. 
because okay. I'll, t- I'll tell you later. Fair enough. And then you can fill in everybody else. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, I, there was an awesome uh, podcast on Jaws called Inside Jaws that Wondery did. I listened to a few years back because it's my favorite movie of all time. And uh, when I, I heard that part, I no, it was the first I'd heard of it. It kind of blew my mind a little bit. So yeah, cool stuff there. Um, and I guess, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we were talking horror earlier. Obviously you're wearing a Jaws t-shirt, your hoodie has a bunch of horror icons on there. What's your favorite horror movie of all time, and what's the best horror movie that you've seen recently? So my fallback classic that I always just pop on for good, straight, entertainment, little chill, little great storyline is The Shining. It, yeah. It's my my classic. Easy answer. My my <laughs> daughter, who's 11 now, at four years old, that was her favorite movie, too, yeah. because I'd watch it so often, and the girls, the twins that fell asleep in the jelly in the hallway. They had jelly on them because they had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Right. <laughs> you know, that, that. And it was made for TV editing with the bath scene. Yeah. You know, That was her favorite movie. And it was always something classic to go back to. And it was something as a kid, you know, you watch and like I had told you as my book report in fifth grade was yeah. The Shining. Yep. But the movie, uh, um, that movie that was originally aired is not like the book. And then they made the made for yeah. TV version. Now, a good movie I had seen, horror movie recently, Spectral. I like that one. Okay. That was a good, that was a good storyline behind Ghosts. Um, trying to think. I mean, I like them all, but to say I, I like them all for different aspects, sure. you know, but I, again, Exorcist, like my classics, I go, I have to go back to the classics yeah. when I was a little kid that I, terrified me. Yeah. Yeah, the ones the ones that scare you as a kid always kind of hold a lasting impression. I know for for me especially. Um, so since you're a huge fan of The Shining, have you seen Doctor Sleep? Oh yeah, I read the books. Oh. I, I read the book the yeah. day it was released. I yeah. got the audio book and and I thought it was book. I thought it was phenomenal. It was. It yeah. went with story number one, like the original movie that was released. Yeah, you and know? That, they did a great job of kind of blending the book with with Kubrick's movie too. And I thought it was it, we, we did an episode on it, and it was it was I love researching it. I love talking about it. It was it was an awesome time. So. Have you been to the Stanley? I have not been to the Stanley. I would love to go to. It's a bucket bucket uh, list place for me. Have you been there? No, I haven't. I haven't yeah. been there. And plus the one in Oregon. Yes. With, uh, the yeah, outside the, uh, scene. With the uh, uh, Mount... Uh, no, 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 no. The Ridgeline? Ridge line. Is the Ridgeline. Ridge line? Line. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. just where the outside shot was. Yes. Like just to be there. The exterior, yep. yeah. Yeah. Awesome. You know, for me, it was, it was going to filming locations too, you know, with Friday the 13th. You know, I, I went to... Camp yeah, Nobi Bosco yeah. in New Jersey and like spent, you know, the whole day there and took tours of it and yeah. like filming locations for great classic horror movies. Like I do, I do like them. And of course, going to classic haunted locations, you know, like, oh, down here we have, uh, as I draw a blank as I just started saying a name. Um, <laughs> in, or, oh, yeah, Orleans Inn. It's a very ah. classic gangster. Irish gangster plays, ghosts are haunting there. Yeah. I'll pop in there once in a while, look at the front desk, look around, oh, any ghosts, yeah. and then I'll leave. Or yeah. I'll have friends stay there, and then I'll go down there and visit them and just hang around. One place that we went to recently that was really cool during the day, and especially at night, too, was – have you ever been up to the Mount Washington Hotel, uh, the Omni up there? No, I have It's not. the sister hotel of the, uh, the Stanley, so it, it feels like you're in The Shining. It's up, it in, the, really it's cool. up in the mountains. It's really creepy. But it feels like you're walking like through the lobby of the Overlook when you're walking around. It's you know the really high ceilings, Native American artwork, animal heads on the walls. That's it's just great. really, really cool. And they and do they a haunted have, history tour that we did. But, and they uh, have yeah, but they have a haunted tour there. And then they have a whole like area called the Cavern, where it's like a speakeasy, prohibition style. And they have a whole area like roped yeah. off that they used to use. It's really, it was really yeah, cool. It's supposed to be pretty haunted, but yeah. yeah, that was that was that was a cool place for sure. Um, do you guys have any questions? I'm just like floored by this whole experience. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like taking this in. I wasn't gonna come initially. I was like, yeah, overnight. I don't think so. Like that's way too much for me. But then I was like, yeah. Well, you know what? I think I've really regretted if I kind of missed. Yeah, that would have been a So I was like, I should just sack up and go. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you had just reminded me, like, go and visit your national historical landmarks, like mm-hmm. Gettysburg. Yeah, Gettysburg, taking American history, and then. Go ghost hunting at night, you know, go to the haunted yeah. locations. That's two in one. That's a great trip. And from, from Plymouth to the front door of the Gettysburg Hotel is exactly eight hours. And that's the downtown center. Wow. Because that's where when I lived okay. in Plymouth, yeah. I went to Gettysburg Hotel 16 times in one year. It took eight hours directly 
front to door to door. So it's not a far drive. Yeah. Well, I know, I know Gettysburg's supposed to be super haunted, uh, just obviously with the amount of people that died there. It's, I would imagine. Uh, it would, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. how would it not? Yeah, for sure. Andrew, you got any questions? I mean, would you say there's any certain experience that you've had that kind of cemented your belief in the paranormal, or do you think it's just a culmination of just... Well, um, I'm a skeptical believer. Now everything's a ghost. Um, I'm skeptical of people's stories. However, that's just me being me. Um, it's, you know, being four years into ghost hunting and not having experience, you know, I started going, yeah, this is all hooey. And, you know, I want to see something because I love horror. I want to try this. And then all of a sudden hearing footsteps coming down the stairs from an attic I just left. And then the, as the years progressed, you know, through the last 16 years, you know, I've been choked from behind. I've been forced down to the ground by unseen hands. Like I mentioned earlier, partially possessed. I brought a ghost home and made my own house haunted. Yeah. You know, and and it's intrusive. It's I, I unfortunately know that side of someone going through this that has entity in their home because it feels like a burglar all the time in your home standing there waiting. Somebody's in your house. You turn a corner, you're going to see somebody or something's moved in your house. Someone's been in your house, but you know your house has been locked up and no one's been there. Um, so it's my personal experiences and hearing from reputable people. Like if Andy were to tell me his ghost story, you know, and he wasn't drinking his great beers he does like to have <laughs> once in a while, and he, and he just came up to me, <laughs> and he started shaking me, Dark, you're not going to believe what me and, you know, me and Fish were doing, and all of a sudden we had this experience, and they both, the expression on their face is not typical. Yeah, I tend to believe them, you know, and, and people that are reputable in society, you know, um, police officers, judges, you know, lawyers, you know. And there are some bad ones too, but you get to weed those out and that what makes you more of a believer. It's believing other people's experiences as well as you relive them as they tell you the stories. That's awesome. Awesome. Anything else you guys? Would you encourage people to try and ghost hunt on their own? Well, never go alone. That's the golden rule of ghost hunting. Never go ghost hunting alone. Um, in case something happens to you, then you have somebody else to call for help. And that's more physical, not ghosts attacking you. Um, but I encourage, if you're interested in doing it, do not, I'm going to start, do not, I'm going to repeat this over and over again, do not do it in your own house. Because <laughs> you might get answers that you don't want. And unfortunately, you're stuck living there. And all of a sudden you think, oh, it'd be fun to try my basement. All of a sudden there's a figure there or you get a recording. Um, you can go to public locations during the day, mostly ghost route 24 seven. People have more experiences at night because there's less interference. Kids are in bed, traffic's away. So people see more, you know, hear more because your senses become in tune with the environment. Light, you know, refraction of light, there's all these light spectrum. But at night when everything's dark, you have three, you have a shade of white, gray, and black. So you get three and you can see a little bit more. Um, I, I would. I mean, if they truly do, you know, go on a tour that has ghost hunters tour. If you've never done it before, you want to try it out. You know, I, you know, I offer ghost hunters tours and so do other people throughout the country offer ghost hunters tours. They'll give you the first aspect of actually putting a piece of equipment into your hand and actually looking for something. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. I wouldn't try it, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was going to say, no, yeah, don't no, get any ideas. Even, no. So you don't want to be playing with I'll a Ouija board? I'll leave it to the experts. You don't, don't want to play with a Ouija know. board in the basement anytime oh, soon no, or anything like that? No. Okay. Come on, I got a 1910 William Folds Ouija board that knocks no. by itself. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's in my Pass. basement. I feel like Ouija boards lead to nothing but trouble. I don't Come on now. <laughs> Come on, Ouija boards made by Parker Brothers? I know. Shoots and ladders? I know. Same I know, I know. It's kind of weird to think about it like that, but... But, you know, okay, I got a question for you. Sure. When you... Use a Ouija board. Mm -hmm. What's the first question you're going to ask that Ouija board? Uh, is there anybody here with right. me? Yeah. So I take my digital voice recorder out and I go, is there anybody here who wants to speak to me? We're doing the same thing, aren't we? We are. Yeah. And there's no there's difference. No game. But there's no board <laughs> and there's no little here, thing right? with the magnifying glass. <laughs> but the <laughs> planchette so and the plastic pieces and the wooden pieces that right. you're playing with, you're holding plastic in your hand. Right. Yeah. It's no usually, you can manipulate it as you wanted to. <laughs> it's usually the intent of spirits being brought to it that make it weird and things happen. So me talking into a digital voice recorder, is it my intent to bring them closer to me and things can start happening? That's one for your listeners to yes. digest. It's a great point. It's a great point. <laughs> Anything else? 
that's all. For all right. Me. Well, uh, you know, obviously, we want to thank you again for coming on, Derek. It's great. This is awesome. So many cool stories. So much good information. And uh, I guess before we let you go, why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, about the Cape and Islands Paranormal Research Society and some of the tours you guys do? What kind of experiences you offer to people that might be interested to come check you guys out? Well, do the unique year we have. Um, uh, it's it's been a unique year to say the least. Um, yeah, I'm waiting for even more scarier stuff to happen. But Cape and Islands Paranormal Research Society is a nonprofit organization. Um, we investigate alleged paranormal activity from ghosts and hauntings mm -hmm. um, to cryptozoology, Bigfoot, okay. Loch Ness monster. I see that. I yetis, do not know. All right, um, he likes that. <laughs> Uh, Chupacabra. Yep. Okay. How oh, about yeah. marsh people? Have you ever heard about marsh people? Marsh people, that's when I've we heard We have it on that. Cape Cod. Okay. And the Native Americans call them puck wedgies. Oh, oh puck wedgies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We have a little bit different, though, here on Cape Cod. We, They're a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we did an episode on the Bridgewater Triangle, so we talked a lot about puck wedgies before. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and uh, my tours, you know, we do them nightly. Usually, the usual season's April to November every single night. You know, Monday and Fridays, we do that ghost hunting experience for people. And all the other nights, we do a two-hour haunted history tour. You come into the old jail on every, at the end of every single tour. So the building we're sitting in, you can join us in coming into this building we're having the broadcast today. Awesome. That's so cool. Well, uh, that's the Cape and Islands Paranormal Research Society, folks. If you want to check them out, if you're ever on Cape Cod and you want to go on a ghost tour, I would highly recommend you do so. It's been a hell of an experience walking around this jail or on the, around the, uh, the cemetery across the street. I had a blast. And Derek, thanks again so much for coming on, man. We, we really appreciate it. No, yeah, thank it you. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, before I should go, I, I, before we go, I, sh I should mention, obviously, <clears throat> so we're here with the guys from Old Colony Cast as well. So this is a two-parter tonight. Uh, so we wanted to cover, obviously, the, you know, the haunted aspect of this place. Uh, some of the stuff going on on Cape Cod. Uh, Andy Fish and Hannah are going to cover some of the historical aspects of this building as well. Yes, so make sure you head on over to Old Colony Cast to check out the second uh, second part of this episode uh, with Derek from Cape and Islands Paranormal Research Society. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks again, man. Thank Thanks, Derek. Hey, everyone. It's Mike from America's Hometown Horror. and just wanted to say thank you again for listening to another episode of our show because, of course, we would be nothing without you listeners. If you are interested in more local Plymouth podcasts, I would highly recommend you check out uh, some shows by our cohorts on the Inebriart Podcast Network. That's right, the Inebriart Podcast Network, folks. In addition to America's Hometown Horror, you can find the Inebriart Podcast, Bar Talk, Theme Park Legends, Retro Redoctopus, and Old Colony Cast. Head on over and give them a listen. On your carts, get set, go! Tonight on ABC, it's a race against time. Put one minute on the clock. To grab the priciest items you can find. She's grabbing a grill. That's $300. Yes! Game! It's the return of the classic game show where you can win a ton of dough. The team that gets highest card total can win $100,000. Hosted by Leslie Jones. This is about to get nuts. Game! Supermarket Sweep. Series premiere. Tonight, 8, 7 central on ABC. Roofers, are you tired of using a bunch of selling tools that don't talk to each other? Streamline your selling process with GAF Project. Manage leads, measurements, presentations, estimates, even payments right on your iPad. Visit gaf.com project.